if you don't mind, I'm just getting closer to you. Because that's what Jesus did. That's what God did. Didn't he? And such a long way from up there. Let's pray, shall we? Father God, I want to thank you. I want to thank you so much. Because, Father, you are, uh, you had this whole thing, this whole thing worked out for us. And, Father, you, uh, you just did it. And, Father, I want to pray, Lord, that tonight, this very evening, Father, while so many of us, we've been through so many Christmases, this over and over and over Christmas, Father, there are some here tonight, Father, who may not know what it's like to have the Saviour born to, for them. And so I want to ask, Father God, by your Spirit, you would move amongst us. You'd be at work doing the thing you do best. Help us, we pray. Give us ears to hear, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Christmas and Easter are two of those times when you know what they're going to talk about in front. Yeah? You know. And as I was preparing, I went through all the, those things, the Christmas stories from, from um, Matthew chapter 1, from Luke chapter 2, and, and you've heard them over and over again. You've heard them alluded to in the, the carols sung. If you were here earlier for the meal, thank you, Mel and her team, uh, for feeding us. Um, you would have heard it there. Uh, there's so much. And it's hard for pastors to become imaginative in that time. We can look online. We can see what other more imaginative pastors do. And perhaps we can borrow from them. But I always feel guilty about that. I feel that's a little bit lazy. And then I thought, or perhaps God led me to perhaps the most underutilised passage, Christmas passage in Scripture. And uh, it's one that's full of mystery and pregnant with meaning. And it's not a Christmas story as such, it's really a description of the Christmas event. And what I'm going to do with it this evening then is I'm going to start with this amazing descriptive passage and then I'm going to fill it up with meaning both from the Old Testament and the New. And, and you know, I want to offer perhaps a time where we might pray for one another or we might ask for God to do something with us, or to us, or for us, afterwards, if that's okay. So, let's get moving and read this amazing Christmas passage. It comes from John's Gospel. And while I could read more, this part of Jesus' story is so full of meaning that it would take me so much longer than just this evening to unpack it all. So... So the passage, like every passage we'll read tonight, will appear on the screen for you. So if you haven't come with your Bibles, that's all right. You'll be able to read it there. But if you have come with your Bibles, it's a good thing. If you don't have a Bible and you want one, see me after. You've come to the right place. Right, the passage is short. It's one verse. In fact, it's half a verse. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. John 1, 14, the first half of that. And this is it. This is the Christmas event. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The story of Mary and Joseph and the baby they named Jesus is this. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The story of angels and shepherds and sheep and stars, wise men and Herod's wrath is this. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The story of angelic visits 
and dreams of the senses. And the manger is this. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. What is this Word who dwells among people? And why is this something that angels would say is good news for all people? What makes it good news? And I suppose for most Christians this is a no-brainer. We know the Word was with God and the Word was God. So John starts his Jesus story in chapter 1. And then here in verse 14, if we were to read on, we would say, we would, we would read that the Word is the only begotten from the Father, with the Father being God the Father. And let's fill that up just for a minute. Let's see what that means. Let's park what we know for a second. Who is this God who is the Word, the only begotten of the Father? You know, the Old Testament makes a truckload of claims about God. If the Word is God, those truckloads of claims are invested in that too. And I just want to look at, at two things, two, two of the claims. The first happens really early in the Bible. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The God who becomes a man and lives among us is that God who is before everything and creates everything. There was nothing that exists before God did not create. We might have different ideas about how that happens. But right now, let's not lose ourselves down the rabbit burrow with Alice. Now, two things. First, he is the creator of everything. God is also the owner of everything. He didn't sell his design or franchise creation. It's his it also mean that he also means he makes the rules concerning it. And if it's not used like it was made to be used, things break and consequences result. We know this with all the toys that we have. If I borrow someone's golf clubs, Jason's golf clubs, if I borrow his golf clubs for a round of golf, his second set, his second set, and then after slicing my first three drives into the adjacent fairway and then try to use the offending clubs because we all know it's the club's fault as an axe the tree will be fine but there will be significant damage to Jason's golf clubs and my back pocket and maybe much much more and this is important because it explains so much about the world we live in. Not so long after God made everything and placed people over it, people broke it. They decided that being made in God's image and likeness wasn't enough. They wanted more. They wanted to be what God was alone. And in their hunger to gain the prize, they stopped believing God and his word. And that broke things. They broke their relationship with God and with each other, within themselves and with the rest of creation. Not good news for the rest of us. Because we have inherited that. Just like our children will inherit the world that we leave them, we inherited what was left for us. The second thing that comes from this verse, first verse in the Bible and how it relates to Christmas in John's book about Jesus is that the God who created everything that we see, we don't see, and we are yet to see, becomes a person. And that same God who owns everything, because he made everything, becomes a baby that can't talk, that messes himself. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? God becomes a baby. Does all the stuff that babies do. Not all of them are pretty, eh? Hey? Not all of them are pretty. Can't meet, 
can't feed himself. Has to grow. He gets a name. Jesus. But when I think about that, it does things to my brain. And not all of them are good things. How can something so big become something so small? How can something so inconceivably large become so minute, cellular even? Is this even a possible thing? How can it happen? Paul, the premier writing apostle in the New Testament, helps us to imagine it when he writes in Philippians 2, 5 to 8. Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. So, God becomes a person by letting go of what was rightfully his and taking up what was rightfully not. And I need to be careful here. There's so much in this passage where you get carried away with the incredible things that God is saying to us here. I need to keep my eye on the ball. Note, please, how Jesus empties himself and takes the form of a servant. That is, he takes the form of God's servant. And he's made in human likeness. How amazing that the one who made people in his image and likeness now comes in the likeness of his creation. I wonder what makes God do this. Even how he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death. Even death on a cross. The second Old Testament bit of the Bible we want to look at to help us understand what it means that the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us is a promise God makes to the people he chose, the nation of Israel, about what he wanted to do about the brokenness evident in the world. And there are lots of different parts of the Bible we could use. But I chose this part from the prophet Isaiah. In chapter 52, verses 13 to chapter 53, verse 6, I think it's a bit longer. We're going to read the following from God. Behold, my servant will prosper. He will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted. Just as many were astonished at you, my people, so his appearance was marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. Thus he will sprinkle many nations. Kings will shut their mouths on account of him, but what had not been told them they will see, and what they had not heard they will understand. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of parched ground. He had no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried, yet we este ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, the chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray, each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. The thing about breaking things is it always costs somebody something to fix it. When I break golf clubs against trees, they somehow don't get fixed just because I say sorry to them. And the tree. And the one who makes the rules. They just don't get fixed because they say sorry. It's the same thing if we apply it to relationships. Someone has to pay 
to get them right. Someone has to pay to fix our relationships with God. Someone has to pay to fix our relationships with one another, within ourselves and with the world around us. Let's just think about that relationship with God for a minute. Who can fix that? Who can pay for it? We can't pay. We're part of the problem. While we're incredibly valued, valuable, we are also completely unworthy either to fix the problem or to receive the restored relationship once they're fixed. I'm convinced as I look around and I look within myself that if I did not inherit brokenness from my ancestors of a, a millennia ago, my offspring would inherit brokenness from me. So who can pay? Who can fix it? God said to the prophet Isaiah that he would send someone to do just that. God will send his servant, and his servant will take that which destroyed the relationship, which is described here as going astray, turning to his own way, which is called iniquity and transgression here, and he will take all the guilt, and he will take all the shame and all the death and all the punishment due to the one who goes astray, who turns to their own way. And he will take it all. Who will pay the cost? God's servant will pay the cost. Who will pay the cost to get you right with the holy creator of everything we see and don't see and are yet to see? Who will pay the price to get it right with the owner of all? God's servant will. Who will pay the cost so that we might forgive each other from the heart? with clean consciences and from a secure place of worth? Who will pay the cost so we can forgive ourselves without compromising what we were created to be? God's servant will. And so it is that God sends his servant to bear the cost. It's amazing that Paul would use this term, servant, to describe what happens when God's chosen one Himself, God, would become flesh and live with us. And see what Paul says he did? See how it's so aligned with God's words to Isaiah some 800 years earlier. What Isaiah says about God's servant being marred beyond recognition, esteemed as nothing, smitten by God, scourged even, pierced and crushed for our iniquities and our transgressions, Paul says in verse 8 of chapter 2, and being found in appearance man, as a man he humbled himself by becoming obedient, even obedient to death, even death on a cross. That death on a cross, scourged, pierced, crushed, smitten by God, marred beyond recognition, is to bear the cost of fixing what we have broken, to fix our brokenness. He pays the price that I can never afford, not if I were to live a million lifetimes. And he grants the benefit of all that to me, even though he knows me. And so the Word becomes flesh and dwells among us. God becomes a person and lives among us. God, creator, owner, the wronged and slated becomes a human, not to punish us or to judge us, not to destroy us or kill us. No, God comes to us as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, as the servant who suffers so that we might be healed. But what would make God do that? Why does God do that? What would compel him to become like you and me? Firstly, because he said he would. All through the Old Testament, God promises to fix what we've broken. All through the Old Testament, he left clues as to what that would be like. Clues like the one we read from Isaiah 53. All through the Old Testament, God puts his reputation and his power at risk whenever he promised to bring back to life the relationship he had with those who placed their faith in him. 
And the second reason is because he loves us. That's often where we start, isn't it? And often where we finish, we think, God loves us. But God's state investment in this, even more than his love for us. But God loves us. A little later in John's story about Jesus, he writes these amazing sentences in John 3, verses 16 and 17. He writes this, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. God loves us, even you and me. It's something we can take for granted, a bit like the love of a husband and wife, or the parents have for children. But we shouldn't. God loves us. God loves the ones who have despised him and his world. God loves the ones who hate one another in their hearts and who have contempt for how he says we should live. Despite living as though God were dead to us, he, the incredibly wronged, continues to love us. But his love for us is not distant, cold and uncaring. Rather, God, the word, becomes flesh and lives amongst us. God's love has a purpose, an action, and that makes it good news. God's action makes his love for us real. And his action is to save us. Christmas is about how God loves us. Christmas is about how God, God's love saves us. It's good news of great joy to all people everywhere. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Tonight you may have never believed that before. You may never have seen that Christmas exists because God wants to save people. You might have never before understood in your heart that you actually needed saving. That you're broken and that you need a saviour. That thought might alarm you. But the thought that God saves people from their transgressions, their going astray, their iniquities, well, that might warm your heart. That might be something you want, if indeed it were possible. Or maybe you've been living as though Christmas is not for you anymore. Years ago you thought it was okay. But life is so complicated now. How can a simple story of Mary, Joseph and a baby called Jesus affect your life? But tonight know that it is not just about any baby born that night. It was God come in the flesh. God comes motivated by love, motivated by his promises to save us and to save even you, despite your apathy toward him. Or maybe you knew Christmas as value, but you've been concerned more about the trappings of life, more about the turkey, the gravy and the pudding, about the cares of this world, and not the next. Perhaps tonight has awakened a newer spark and a hope Perhaps this event wherein God became a man to save you from judgment that no person can even bear has caused you to pause and wonder if, they, if there's a way and that the way you've been living is really important. If any of these is you, I want to pray for you. If this is anyone here, I want to pray for you. We're going to bow our heads, close our eyes. I'm going to pray. And if any of these are you, I want you to do something in response to that. I want you to, to stand or raise your hand or lie flat on the ground. I don't care. Just do something. If that's you, know that if we honour him before people in this life, he will honour us before his Father. So do not be afraid. Just bow our heads. Let's pray. I'm not about my head too, so I won't know. It's not about me. It's about him. Father God, 
What can we say? You've done this amazing thing we celebrate today. You have done it. And, and you love us. Father God, I'm going to pray you work in our hearts. Father, even us who are still amazed that you would love us so, that you, God, would become a person that you would live amongst us, that you would bear our sins. We're still amazed at that. We still wonder at the love that makes that happen. And Father, for those who might be responding to this the first time, I pray that you would restore that relationship with, with you that they might know life and know it abundantly. And Father, I pray, Lord, they would begin to hear your voice to them. And Father, for those, Father, who have forgotten about this, Father, I pray, Lord, you would bring them renewal and revival this Christmas. That they would know how much you love them and how much you love their neighbour. And the Father, they would be excited by that love and excited by the promises you have for them. And that, Father, this Christmas season would mark a new start, a new beginning in their life. Where, Father, they are so alive to you and you to them. And, Father God, I pray, Lord, that, that for each of us, Father, this Christmas we might find uh, ways which are truly unique to love and honour you. And pray, Lord, that we will get opportunities to share your grace and your goodness with others who don't know you. And Father, we pray, Lord, that your spirit might be at work in their hearts. That, Father, there might be more people in our family after this Christmas than there was before. Be with us, we pray. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Um.